Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. Is the spirit of another wife a dangerous thing or not? In today's story we find out. Enjoy watching it. My workday had just ended, and I was heading to a restaurant where my wife, Terry, of 16 years, said I should meet her and our two teenagers, April and Robert. Today, I turned 40, and I wondered what she had in store for me. This morning, she woke me up with Intim and told me it was just the beginning. Naturally, I thought about it all day, especially since she had never done anything like this before. See you, Jack, my secretary, ah, uh, personal assistant, said as I left my office. I'm Jack Thornton, by the way, and I work as the CFO of a company that makes specialized equipment for other manufacturers. I won't go into details because they can get pretty boring, suffice it to say that we make things that other factories use to produce their goods. I hope this makes sense. We do quality work, make a lot of money, and employ many people. My job is to ensure we continue to profit. Earlier that day, there was a small celebration at the office. Nothing special, but I appreciated their effort and care. They all wished me well, and we had a good time. Alan Charles, our general manager, bought a nice cake, and everyone else brought snacks and drinks. Of course, there were jokes about my age. For example, someone gave me a cane, and another man handed over a jar of soil with a note that read, A scientist has found one thing that is older than Jack Thornton. I had a good laugh, everyone knew about my love for antiques. To my surprise, they chipped in and bought an old Victrola gramophone. I immediately recognized it as a genuine manual victor with an external horn easily worth over $5,000. Guys, this is too much, I said. You shouldn't have done this, I added. Nonsense, said Alan. Where do you think your annual bonus went? We all laughed. After the party, I rearranged the items on my dresser, placing the old record player in the center, surrounded by happy birthday cards. I wanted everyone in the office to know how grateful I was for this gift. Alan came into my office and looked at the display on my dresser, smiling as I placed the cards around. I hope you like it, he said. I really like it, I replied, but seriously, you spent too much money. An original manual Victrola in this condition usually costs several thousand, and there aren't many left. This thing looks almost like new. It actually didn't cost that much, he said. I was surprised. He handed me a business card with the name and address of a store that had recently opened. The lady who runs the place, I think her name is Vicky, was hired to sell a collection of artifacts from a collector who recently died. She said she had some old records that would be good for it. Of course I'm interested, I said, taking the business card. Thank you. He smiled and nodded his head as he began to walk away. Please, he said, enjoy. After he left, I called the number on the business card and spoke to Vicky. Yeah, I remember selling that old Victrola, she said. It was part of a collection my uncle left behind, and I was asked to sell it after he died. I was told you have records that would suit it, I said. Do you still have them? Yes, I have about ten of them, and you can have them all if you want. How much do you want for all this? I asked. Well, since you already have a Victrola, I'll give them away cheaply, say, for $20. $1.20 for a collection of old 78 revolutions per minute wax records? I thought. Damn it, I'll take them. Can you leave them for me? Of course, she replied. I gave her my name and phone number and agreed to stop by in the morning on my way to work. But now, I had other priorities. When the workday was over, I headed to the restaurant to see what surprises my wife and children had in store for me. Terry had always been great at these things. I thought she might give me something to complement my collection of antiques, but what exactly? A sword? An old rifle? I already had a lot of these things, including a sword with the inscription Republic of Texas. I also had several antique long guns hanging on the wall, including smoothbore .75 caliber brown best muskets with fixed bayonets, dating back to the Revolutionary War. Of course, I had never shot them, but I did shoot replicas. There was a lot of money hanging on those walls, but my collection wasn't about the money, it was about touching history and understanding that these objects were once used in the daily lives of people shaping the future. 
I have always loved history and tried to instill this passion in our children by telling them stories of bravery, sacrifice, and courage in the days before modern conveniences such as cell phones and the internet. I also had several pieces of antique furniture, including a rocking chair that my great-grandfather made for his wife. We never sat in it, but we used it as a coaster for one of my wife's blankets, and there was a set of large stuffed bunnies that my daughter once made as an anniversary gift. They were supposed to represent Terry and me, she said. So, I wondered what Terry and the kids had chosen for my birthday. When I parked in the lot and walked into the restaurant, I knew she was already there because I saw her car when I pulled up. As I entered the restaurant, I was shown to a large table where Terry and the children were already sitting. I gave my wife a big kiss and hugged my kids. So, how was your day? She asked. Very well, actually, I replied. The guys threw me a party and gave me an old Victrola. Can you believe it? I've always wanted one of those things. What is it? Dad asked Robert. It's an old record player, I said. It has a handle and a big horn attached to the needle, no electronics or anything. How does it play records, then, he asked. I laughed. Well, it doesn't play modern vinyl records for one thing. Back then, all records were made of wax and played at 78 revolutions per minute, much faster than modern records. Besides, a needle on this thing would destroy a modern album. Wow, he said, it's a shame there wasn't YouTube back then. We all laughed about it. We ordered dinner and then had a slice of cake and pie. I was surprised when the entire staff came to our table and sang happy birthday. Even Terry and the kids joined in. We all clapped, and April gave me a big hug. Happy birthday, Daddy, she said. We love you. I hugged her back. I love you all too, I said, looking at my family with moist eyes. I love you all so much. Just being here with you is the best birthday present. That's not all, Terry said. There is something else. What is it? I asked. She took out a small box from her purse and placed it on the table in front of me. What is this? I asked. Your gift, she said, from all of us. I opened the box and found car keys inside. I looked at them, not understanding. Do you remember that old 1957 Chevy you saw a while ago? Terry asked. I nodded. It was a two-tone red and white Chevy coupe parked next to an old house. It seemed as if it hadn't been driven in many years. Well, I talked to the people who lived there, and they said the car belonged to an old man who died recently, she said. It hasn't started in years, so Robert had her checked out. We towed her to the house this morning. You always said you wanted a project car that you could work on with the kids, so we thought, why not? We bought her. She's not in bad shape, Robert said. The interior looks almost new. It needs some engine work and some paint, but the body is in excellent condition, not a speck of rust. I don't know what to say, guys, I said, holding back tears. That sounds wonderful. Thank you so much. This is the best birthday of my life. We all hugged, then started to get ready to leave. Before we went to our cars, Terry came up to me and kissed me deeply. Your party isn't over yet, sailor, she said with a seductive look that I knew all too well. I'll give you my gift later tonight. I saw that sparkle in her eyes, which meant this night was going to be even more fun. I smiled and kissed her back. I can't wait, I said with a grin, watching her walk to her car and feeling the familiar excitement. It had been a while since we made love. I didn't know why this happened, it just seemed like we were either too tired or something was bothering us. It wasn't about my job, I rarely went anywhere and seldom drank with the guys. On the way home, it dawned on me that the real reason Terry and I were so rarely together was because of her schedule. She sells real estate, and although she makes good money, she is away a lot more than I would like, sometimes on weekends and sometimes in the evenings. Once a month, she leaves to have fun with the girls from the office, and I never stopped her from doing this. I knew her job was stressful, so I preferred that she not take it out on her family. But there were several times when I thought she had too much to drink on those evenings, and more than once, I smelled men's cologne on her. I never thought that she could cheat because it would be the end for both of us. Besides, Terry never flirted and was never like that. 
She was friendly, polite, and always professional in public, but she never flirted or made advances toward other men. I think that was one of the things that attracted me to her in the first place. Still, I couldn't help but wonder sometimes. She is several years younger than me and still looks very good. When she dresses up for a night out, she could easily pass for someone much younger. Plus, her time in the gym has really helped her stay in good shape. But something nagged at me. It had been almost two months since we had done anything, and about three weeks since I had even seen her without anything. Worse, she almost seemed like two completely different people. I had no idea who I would see when I returned home, the sweet, loving woman I married or the distant, selfish, hot-tempered vixen she sometimes became. We drove into our garage. I grabbed my briefcase and got out of the car at the same time as Terry and the kids. Robert immediately approached me. Did you see the car, Dad? He asked. I saw her because she was standing next to the garage under a tarp. We all went over to have a look, and I was impressed with the condition of the car. Robert was right, there was not a single speck of rust on the body, which looked almost new. There were a few places where the paint had started to fade, but I thought it could be easily fixed. I looked under the car and saw no leaks, another good sign. What do you think, Dad? He asked, excited. I nodded my head. Maybe we'll start looking at the engine this weekend, I said. His smile became even wider, and it seemed to me that he was about to start jumping for joy. Terry came up to me as we walked around the car. I hope you like it, she said. I like it very much, darling, I replied. We'll get this car back on the road soon, and we can all ride in it together. How about that? She smiled and shook her head. Boys and their toys, she said, and then she turned and walked into the house. We followed. Do you have homework? I asked. No, said Robert. Don, April also said. We had a strict rule in our house that homework had to be done first. Today was an exceptional occasion, as they took me to dinner, and I was ready to let them go this time. After all, it was my birthday. Okay, I said, heading upstairs to change. Terry had already gotten up and was in the bathroom. When I entered the bedroom, I put my briefcase down and put on my tracksuit. We were all tired from the day's activities and I was looking forward to time alone with Terry, something we hadn't had much of lately. As I was putting on my sneakers, Terry came out of the bathroom wearing shorts and a t-shirt. She looked great in shorts, and I loved looking at her smooth, toned legs. The t-shirt showed off her midriff slightly, and her B-cup breasts looked very attractive. She saw the expression on my face, smiled, and shook her finger. It's not time yet, she said. The children are not asleep yet. Wait. Oh, come on, I said. Careful, she said, laughing. We went down, took some soda, and plopped down on the sofa. I took the TV remote control, as usual, and turned it on. Did anything interesting happen in your world today? I asked. Not really, she replied. Still the same. I have a potential buyer for the Parker house. Really? I knew she had been trying to sell this old Victorian house for a long time. The sellers wanted big money for it, but it was too big a house for most buyers looking at it. At least that's what Terry said. That's good news, isn't it? I asked. Yes, she said quietly. This house has been a thorn in my side for too long. I may have to work several evenings on it if this buyer doesn't take it. I knew what that meant. I would have to be the replacement mom while she showed the house to potential buyers. Some of these showings sometimes went on until 8 or 9 p.m. I often wondered who goes out looking at houses so late. Personally, I don't like being alone in this house, she said quietly. It's so big, and it just has a weird vibe to it. I can't explain it. Are you saying it's cursed? I asked. She laughed and shook her head. I could handle ghosts she said jokingly. No, it's something different. I can't explain it. Well, old Jonas Parker lived there a long time, didn't he? I asked. They say all my life, she answered. He was 93 when he died. It took the family months to get all his stuff out of there. You wouldn't believe how much they took out, boxes and boxes of trinkets and things. 
Was he some kind of collector or something? I asked. Not really, she replied. He's more likely a hoarder. He did a lot of crazy things, old things. I heard that his niece has taken over his business and is trying to sell it all. Vicky something, I don't know. All I know is that this house seems strange to me. I took out the business card that Alan had given me earlier. Is this the one who sells all these things? I asked, handing her the card. Yes, I think it's her, she replied, handing the card back to me. Maybe the kids and I could come with you if it would help. I'd like to finally see my wife in action. She laughed nervously. No, but thanks for the offer anyway, she said. I usually ask someone from the office to come with me. I was interested in her choice of words, not one of the girls from the office, but someone from the office. I remembered this for the future. You don't mind babysitting those evenings, do you? She asked. Of course not, I replied. Maybe this will give us a chance to look into parts and pieces for the car. By the way, I'm curious, how much did you spend on this thing? Hopefully not too much. I won't tell, she said. It is a gift from us to you, and it would be impolite and unfortunate to say. I will only say that it was very reasonably priced, much less than I first thought. Well, I really, really like it, I said. I remember my grandfather had a car like this when I was a kid. He used to ride in it with us. Just please don't hang those fuzzy dice on the mirror, she said. I'll die of embarrassment if anyone sees me in a car with those. I laughed. Okay, agreed, I said. Note for future reference, I said, pretending to write something on a piece of paper. No dice on the mirror. She playfully slapped my arm with her right hand. You prankster, she said jokingly. At that moment, I first noticed the ring on her hand. I had never seen it before, it looked quite simple but had some kind of pattern that I couldn't make out. What is this? I asked. She looked down for a second before answering. Oh, this, she asked. I found it in my jewelry box the other day and decided to wear it. Did she just lie to me? I had never seen this ring before, but then again, she had a lot of jewelry, so I decided to leave it to one side for now. Another thing to remember for the future. By then, the kids were in the living room, and we spent the rest of the evening watching TV and talking about the car. Soon, it was time for bed, and we all headed upstairs. I'll be right back, she said, heading into the master bathroom. I had already done my business in the bathroom and wondered what she might be doing there. I had taken off my clothes down to my underpants and had just crawled under the covers when the door opened, and she came out wearing a short, light, translucent nightgown and nothing else. I almost stopped breathing when I saw her, she looked so cute in that thing. Do you like what you see, sailor? She asked in a husky voice filled with desire. Oh my god, you're so beautiful, I said, and pretty. She smiled and walked toward me. We made love. It was very interesting to witness her definitely new behavior in bed, something had clearly changed in her. I smiled and kissed her. Happy birthday, she said. I hope you liked your gift. That was wonderful, I said. What's gotten into you? I realized I've been putting you off for quite a while now, and I wanted to give you a night you'll never forget, she said. You definitely did, I told her. I love you so much. And I love you, my husband, she said. We hugged and fell asleep. The next day began as usual, with preparing breakfast and sending the children to school. Robert and April looked at us with knowing looks, and I wondered if they had heard us last night. They left, and I took a cup of coffee with me. As always, I noticed that Terry didn't have a ring on her right hand. Anything special today? I asked her. She smiled and shook her head. No, not unless you try to stay on your feet as much as possible, she said. You wore me out last night. I laughed at this. I really enjoyed it last night. I never knew you were such a wildcat in bed. She smiled and kissed me. You were great too, she said. I hope you had a happy birthday. Yes, honey, I said, and it's thanks to you. Only because I love you so much, she said. I have to go. See you tonight. See you later, I said, and I love you too.
We kissed and walked out the door. On my way to work, I stopped at the address Vicky gave me yesterday and went inside. The store was filled with all sorts of things. If I didn't have anything else to do, I could easily spend a couple of hours here. Eventually, a young woman came out. You must be Mr. Thornton, she said with a smile, holding out her hand to me. Yes, and please call me Jack, I said, shaking her hand. I got these records ready for you, Jack, she said, walking behind the counter. She pulled out a large cloth shopping bag from behind the counter. I think we agreed on $20 for the whole pack. Yeah, that's right, I said, taking a 20 from my wallet. You have a wonderful place here. Did all this come from Parker's house? Yes, that's right, she said. Did you know my Uncle Jonas? I shook my head. No, I said. I only know what my wife told me. She's selling his house. Her face brightened as she remembered Terry. Oh, of course, she said. Terry Thornton. I should have realized that. Yeah, she does a great job. She seems to come in almost every day to get something done. I heard she might have a couple of buyers looking at the house. Honestly, I'm surprised that she found someone so quickly. We didn't expect the house to sell in the near future. She's there almost every day. I asked. That was not the impression I got from her. Almost, Vicky said. My brother even gave her a small ring as a thank you for all her hard work. I see, I said. So the story about the ring was also a lie, I thought. Oh, it's nothing special, just a little trinket that my uncle picked up on his travels, Vicky said. I hope you didn't misunderstand me. Of course not, I said. I looked at the records and saw that they were in brown paper sleeves with a cutout for the label. Most of them were recordings of bands and singers from the past, but one had a label without any marks or writing. Any idea what's on this one? I asked Vicky. No, none, she said, shaking her head. We didn't really mess around with that old thing, we didn't want to risk the records breaking. They're old, you know, and can break easily. I think it was a record my uncle made for his wife a long time ago. Back in the day, they were saying it was a love letter for her or something like that. I think I asked him about it once, and he only said that this was a message specifically for the listener. I thought he was saying some kind of philosophical riddle, so I didn't insist. Interesting, I said. So all this was brought from his house? Every last one, she said. And that's not all. This is an addition to the inventory he had at the time of his death. I just didn't have enough space to bring it all. I see, I said. Well, it was really nice talking to you, and I think I'll be back to look at the rest of the things you have. I love antiques. She smiled, her eyes sparkling. I'll be glad to see you again, Jack, she said. If you have any questions or concerns, please call. I'll definitely do that, I said, heading toward the exit. Just as I was about to leave, she spoke seriously. Jack, she said, the smile fading, any time of the day or night, I'm always here. I thought about her words and the tone in which they were said. I nodded my head. I'll remember this, Vicky, I said. Thanks again. I drove to work, thinking about what Vicky told me about Terry. I was very concerned about the lie regarding the ring and why Vicky's brother would give Terry a ring. It didn't make any sense to me. Then I thought about how Terry acted last night. Of course, she had always been a passionate woman and often encouraged me during a night, but last night she was a completely different woman. There was little, if any, love in what we did, it was so unlike her. I arrived at the office and went inside. When I got there, I decided to play one of the albums, so I chose the one labeled John Phillips, Salsa Stars and Stripes Forever. I thought it would cheer everyone up. I wound up the spring mechanism inside, placed the record on the green felt covering the turntable, turned on the turntable, and placed the needle on the record. Soon, the sounds of a marching band playing Stars and Stripes Forever began to play from the outside horn. The sound was a bit tinny, and unfortunately, the volume and tone were not adjustable. Still, I thought it sounded good. Everyone looked at me like I was crazy when the music started. About a minute after the song began, Alan came into my office. Are you trying to give us all a heart attack? He asked, laughing. 
I just thought it would cheer everyone up, I replied. Well, you succeeded. Is there a way to make it quieter, he asked. I shook my head. No, chief, I said. Those old things didn't have volume control. Well then, close the door, please, he said, preparing to leave. It will be done, I replied. After he left, I closed the door and listened to the record play. I was really impressed with how the record sounded on that old turntable, but I had work to do, so after finishing the recording, I turned off the record player and went about my duties. I wanted to listen to the record with the blank label, but I knew I would have to wait until I found a way to play it quietly. It was the end of the quarter for us, and I was busy with meetings and spreadsheets for a few days, making sure everything was in order. I reviewed all the expense reports, balance sheets, and spreadsheets submitted by the various departments. I also spent a lot of time going over our tax documents, so I didn't have much time to work on researching the gramophone. During this time, I also watched Terry closely. I noticed a few things after a few days, call it a trend if you want. First of all, she always wore that ring on the days when she visited the Parker house. I also realized that we never had an intimate on those days, or most days, but never on the days she wore the ring. I also noticed that her temperament was significantly different on the days she was in the house. Instead of the carefree, happy woman I married, she seemed distant and sometimes short-tempered. At first, I thought it was the stress of selling the house, but she was always under pressure to sell more properties, so that couldn't be the reason. What was so special about these days? I also noticed that she was spending more days at the Parker house and was coming home later and later. Sometimes she didn't come home until midnight. She always dressed professionally and never looked unkempt when she came home. I never said anything because I didn't want to upset her. In those rare moments when I asked if everything was okay, she would simply say, everything is fine, brushing me off and walking away. Eventually, the kids started to notice too. They both came up to me and asked if everything was okay between me and Terry. It's all because of this house, I told them. I hope she sells it soon. It's like she's a different person, and I want our old mama back, April said. Yes, me too, I replied. By mid-October, my work had calmed down a bit. By that time, I had found, as it seemed to me, a solution to the volume problem. I found a few sites that said they used to put socks in the horn to muffle the sound. According to one site, this is how the phrase put a sock in it came about. Whatever would work, I thought, but I didn't want to use anything that would scratch the decorative wood horn, so I found a soft towel and decided to give it a try. The next day, I stuck a towel into the horn of the old record player and tested it on stars and stripes forever. Of course, it worked as expected. I could even leave the office door open, and no one would mind. I decided to try it with an unlabeled record during my lunch break. When the time came, I took my lunch out of the refrigerator, a sandwich, a banana, a small bag of chips, and a Pepsi, which I had prepared myself since Terry had been too busy lately to care. I closed the door, put up the dining sign, and pulled down the blinds as a signal to everyone else not to disturb me, then turned on the record player. I had just taken a bite of my sandwich when I heard a slightly distorted man's voice coming from the megaphone. Good afternoon, Mr. Thornton, said the man's voice. I almost spat Pepsi out of my nose. I looked at the Victrola, shocked. Yes, I'm talking to you, Mr. Thornton. Jack, isn't it? May I call you Jack? Ah, uh, yeah, Jack will do, I said. Who are you? I'm Jonas Parker, the man said. But how is this possible? I asked. Your physical shell is indeed no longer functioning and is considered dead by your concept of reality, but the essence of who I really am continues to exist, the man said. You could call it a soul. But how is this possible? I asked again. The man laughed before continuing. How did the great bard write? He asked. Oh yes, there are many things in the world, friend, that our sages never dreamed of. You can't even imagine how right he was. But how do you talk to me through this gramophone? I asked. Because it once belonged to me, he said. It has been in my house for many years, and like many other things in my house, it has become, as you might say, enchanted or cursed, as the case may be. 
although I am glad that it is now in the hands of someone who appreciates history as much as you do. I know it will be well looked after. You still haven't answered my question, I said. How is all this possible? Very good, said the man. I don't have time to explain over 50 years of work, but I'll give you a quick overview. In 1921, an amateur archaeologist named Alfred Watkins discovered that ancient sites around the world, both man-made and natural, appeared to be arranged in straight lines. These lines were later called ley lines, and the points where these lines intersected were considered to be saturated with pockets of supernatural energy that some individuals could harness. It turned out that my house was located at the intersection of six such lines. My grandfather was something of a spiritualist in his day and thought that this place was special, so he built a house there long before Watkins made his discovery. Naturally, I continued his work and traveled the world in search of clues, anything that could give me answers. Along the way, I collected many artifacts and trinkets that, in themselves, had a certain power, but when they were collected together in this place, their power increased incredibly. I learned to use the power of these items to my advantage. You see, the so-called scientific community didn't want to hear what Watkins and his ilk had to say. They dismissed it as nonsense. So I set out to prove them wrong. I spent over half a century collecting and researching. I sold many of the items I collected but kept others. You wouldn't believe how much information I gained. In the end, I was able to understand almost everything, but there was one step I needed to take before I could reach my ultimate goal, he said. What was it? I asked. I needed to let my physical body die, he said. And here I am. You're crazy, I said. He grinned. Perhaps, he said. I've been called that and worse by experts. But think about it, of the two of us, who is talking to whom? I got it, I said. We each have our purpose, Jack, he said. Mine is to travel the continuum of time and space and enjoy all that is there. Yours is to raise your two children to become responsible adults, and your wife is now fulfilling her destiny. What are you talking about? I asked, my anger growing. Oh Jack, you know exactly what I mean, he said. You mean selling your house? He laughed. Sale, he asked. God forbid. She doesn't sell it, she cooks it. For what? I asked. Stop talking in riddles, damn it. For our return, he said. My wife was taken from me many years ago by a cruel disease. In short, I was robbed of a life full of love and happiness. I intend to give that back. How do you plan to do this? I asked. And what role does my wife play in your plan? I'm sure you noticed the ring I gave her, he said. This design originated from an ancient tribe that believed the dead could replace the souls of the living. The design on this ring makes this possible. Your wife's body will soon become the bearer of the soul of my dear late wife forever. Haven't you noticed a change in your wife lately? I noticed, I said. That's because the human mind wasn't designed to accommodate two people, he said. My wife's soul is slowly taking over your wife's body and mind. During this time, she is learning to adapt and take advantage of what your wife's body. And what will happen to my wife's soul? I asked. Eventually, she will replace Annabelle's soul in the great afterlife, he said. Soon there will be no need for the ring when Annabelle becomes strong enough. She will completely supplant your Terry. You'll never succeed, I said. He laughed. Jack, Jack, he said in a patronizing tone. Please don't insult my intelligence. Look at the big picture. Okay, there's no way to stop something that's already started. And who will believe you? You'll be sent to a mental hospital, and who will take care of your children then? Why not just accept the inevitable and move on with your life? There are a lot of women in the world, you know. Many of them would like to be with a person like you. This can't be real, I said quietly. Oh, but it's really real, Jack, he said. This is as real as it gets. Look, I'd love to continue the conversation, but the recording is long over and I really need to get back to what I was doing. I know this is a lot for you to take in at one time. Terry left a message for you on one of the records you bought this morning. The label is clearly marked. In the meantime, listen to this. His voice disappeared and was replaced by sounds of a man and woman having a night. 
I heard a woman's voice in the background and knew it was Terry. I looked and saw that the needle was in the last channel next to the label. I didn't know how long she had been there. Shocked, I lifted the needle and stopped the player. I pulled the wax slab off the turntable and placed it back into the paper envelope before putting it away. I looked closely at the other albums and found one with an RCA label that said, For Jack by Terry. Strange, I thought. It wasn't there this morning. How is this possible? I thought about playing the record but had another idea. I had a record player at home that could play 78 revolutions per minute records, so I decided to take the record home and listen to it there and confront my wife if necessary. I looked at the time and realized that my lunch break was almost over. Did I really talk to a dead man through an old gramophone for that long? Shocked, I threw away the rest of my lunch and returned to my desk. I called Terry's office, hoping to speak with her. Is Terry Thornton there? I asked the secretary. Sorry, Jack, but she's been out all day, said the secretary. I don't expect her to return until tomorrow. Can I pass something on? No, it's okay, I said. I'll talk to her later. I ended the call, then took out my business card and called Vicky. Hi, Jack, I was expecting your call, she said. Do you want to come over so we can talk? Yes, I said. How did you know I was going to call? Call it feminine intuition, she said. I advise you to come as soon as possible. Okay, I'll be right there, I said, ending the call. I went to Alan's office. He looked at me and invited me to come in. I went in and closed the door behind me. What happened, Jack, he asked. You don't look good. Are you okay? I need to take a vacation, I said. Family emergency. Well, you have accumulated hours, and we don't have anything urgent right now, so take a vacation. A few days will help sort it out, he said. If there's anything I can do to help, let me know. Thanks, Alan, I said. I appreciate it. With these words, I returned to my office, put the record from Terry in my briefcase, and left. I decided to drive past the old Parker house to see if Terry was there. Of course, she was. I saw her car along with another one parked in front of the house. I couldn't go in because the iron gates were closed. I looked but didn't see any signs indicating the house was for sale. Strange, I thought. From there, I went straight to Vicky's store. I needed answers, and I hoped she could give them to me. When I arrived, I walked inside and saw her behind the counter. She looked at me when I entered. Good afternoon, Jack, she said. I'm guessing you want answers. You're right, I said. She nodded, went to the door, and locked it, hanging the sign closed. She turned and walked to the back of the store to what I assumed was her office. She stopped and turned to me. Maybe you should come with me, she said. I followed her into a small, crowded office with a desk and three chairs. One of the chairs stood in the corner and was covered with a blanket. She invited me to sit on another chair and sat down at the table herself. I'm guessing you listened to a record with a blank label, she said. I nodded. You could say that. Moreover, I had a conversation with the man who wrote this record. What can you tell me about your uncle? Well, for starters, he was actually my great uncle, my grandfather's older brother, she said. He had two degrees, one in archaeology and the other in history. He married and taught for a while, but after his wife died of meningitis, he left college and began exploring the world, collecting artifacts from around the world. About 35 years ago, he returned to the old house and opened this store. He never married again and always talked about how he and his beloved wife would one day be together again. Did he say how this can happen? No, he didn't, she replied, but he talked a lot about otherworldly things, about the supernatural. Was he involved with the occult sciences? I asked. I can say that he was accused of this more than once, and I can say that he did things that I would never want to do, she said. I nodded in understanding. Do you want to see a photo of his wife? She asked. Of course, I replied. She turned to the computer and opened a black and white photograph of a beautiful woman in her mid-twenties. I looked at the photo in shock. She looked like Terry's doppelganger. Vicky saw the expression on my face. 
I took out my phone and showed her a recent photo of Terry. She looked at it, also surprised. What's your wife's maiden name? She asked. Hanson, I answered. Vicky opened another file on her computer. My uncle Jonas was very into genealogy, she said. Originally, he had everything on paper, but a few years ago he entered everything into the computer. She pointed to one of the cells. This is his wife, Annabelle. Her maiden name was Simpson, and according to him, she had a sister named Frida. We know that Annabelle had no children, and Uncle Jonas never remarried. Let's trace Frida's line and see what we find. We both stared at the screen, following the lines through the generations. Luckily, there weren't many people to go through, but Vicky found what she was looking for and pointed to one of the cells on the screen. I saw Terry and Hanson. Next to it was a box with my name on it, connected to the line leading to our marriage. Below were the names of our children. Here's your answer, she said. He was waiting for someone who would resemble Annabelle. Do you have a photo of your brother? I asked. Yes, she answered, opening a folder of photographs. She found his photo and showed it to me. How similar is he to your uncle? I asked. Very much, she said. His name is Donald. They were very close. Is it possible that your uncle asked him to give her this ring? I asked. Anything is possible, she replied. Did your uncle have records of the things he collected over the years? Yes, she answered. Mostly for inventory. Everything is in the database he spent years building. Can you find information about the query's ring and soul? I asked. Yes, I can, she replied, opening a special database program. She typed in the terms and pressed enter. Several results appeared, most of which were marked as sold. The top element caught my attention. It was the same ring that I saw on Terry's hand. Vicky clicked on the item's description, and we read the note left by Jonas. According to this, he found this ring at a dig site in Central Africa, Vicky said. Local legends said that an ancient tribe used such a ring to communicate with the dead. The wearer could supposedly channel the spirit of a deceased person and even take on some of their personality traits. But there is a warning here, if worn long enough, the spirit of the deceased can displace the spirit of the person who wears the ring. Oh God, I said. Did Jonas say anything about how the trial could be reversed? There is a recording of the spell here, she replied. According to Jonas, it must be spoken by two women, and one of them must be a relative of the ring bearer. Terry's mother lived in Florida and was too far away to make it in time, but there was one other person. It was a risk, but if we wanted Terry back, it had to be done. Are you ready to help me break this spell? Yes, I'm ready, she replied. But we need two women. Where will you get the second one? I'll pick her up from school, I replied. Print out two copies of the spell, please. I need to call the school. Okay, she replied. While she was doing this, I called April's school and told them we had a family emergency and I needed to pick her up. They wanted to know what it was, and I just said it had to do with her mother. The deputy director reluctantly agreed, and I said I would be there soon. By the time I ended the call, Vicky was ready. Can you enter through the gate and door into your uncle's house? I asked. Of course, she replied. Okay, I said. If you've unsealed the spell, let's go. I'll bring you back later. We headed to the school, where April was already waiting for us outside. She got into the car and looked at Vicky with bewilderment. What's going on, Dad? She asked. Is Mom okay? Who is this woman? No, she's not fine, honey, I replied. By the way, this is Vicky. Vicky, meet April, my daughter. Vicky handed her a spell. Vicky handed her a piece of paper with a strange spell printed on it in large letters. April looked at it with furrowed brows. What is this, Dad? This is nonsense, she said. We're going to the old Parker house, I said. When we get there, you and Vicky will have to read it together. Can you do it? Probably, she replied. But I don't understand anything. What is this, and what does it have to do with Mom? Remember when you said you wanted your old mom back? I asked. Yes, 
She answered. This is the only way this can happen, I told her. I really can't explain anymore. I don't fully believe it myself. What? April asked, almost hysterical. Vicky turned to her. My Uncle Jonas did a lot of strange things, she said. He's to blame for what's happening to your mom. But he's dead. April said. Only his body is dead, Vicky said. I'll explain later. Just remember this spell. Follow me when I say it. We'll say it together. Got it? Your father is counting on you to do it. April calmed down, looked at my reflection in the mirror, then nodded her head. Okay, she said quietly. I saw her carefully reading the paper while I was driving. Finally, we arrived at the Parker house. Vicky entered a series of numbers on the panel in front of the gate. When she did, the gate opened and I drove inside, stopping next to Terry's car. Vicky turned to April. Remember, follow me, she said. There may be things going on here that will shock you. Just ignore whatever you see. Remember, this is not your real mother. Understood, I guess she replied. We got out of the car and walked to the front door. Vicky had already taken out her keys and opened the door. We entered and looked around but saw no one. Listening closely, I recognized the voice. It was Terry. What's going on here? April asked. You don't want to know, honey, I told her. Vicky put a finger to her lips, indicating for us to remain silent. We followed the voices to the stairs leading to the basement and went down. We entered a large, dimly lit chamber and saw two figures, Terry and Donald. Both had just put on their dressing gowns and were tying their belts when we entered. I noticed he was wearing a ring very similar to Terry's. They looked at us, surprised by our appearance. What are you doing here, boy? Terry asked, an evil grin appearing on her face. Her eyes changed and became completely black. Who is this girl? I could ask you the same question, Terry, I said. What are you doing here? You're definitely not selling real estate, that's for sure. And this girl is our daughter. Don't you remember your own daughter? Terry laughed. Terry's not here right now, boy, the woman said. Call me Annabelle. I don't have children, not yet. I'm just getting used to this body. She looked at me, and I noticed that his eyes were also completely black. It's just as I told you before, Jack, my boy, he said in Jonah's voice. You don't belong in this dimension anymore. Uncle Jonas, Vicky said. It's time for you and Aunt Annabelle to go back to where you really belong. She looked at April and nodded. Both began to chant the spell in unison. No! Donald exclaimed. This can't happen. You can't do this. As the two women recited the spell, the atmosphere in the room became more tense. I looked and saw that two vortexes had appeared above Donald and Terry, each one spinning faster and faster. Their eyes sparkled for a moment, and the swirls became more pronounced. It seemed to me that there were figures in the whirlwinds, strange hooded creatures with fiery eyes. I looked at Vicky and April and saw that they had an electrified aura surrounding them. Their eyes were wide open and glowing with fire. They held the papers to their sides and now recited the spell as one, as if on autopilot. Terry and Donald screamed and tried to escape from the vortexes, which by that time had completely engulfed their bodies. Everything continued to intensify, the charge in the room grew stronger. Suddenly, everything disappeared, and the room returned to normal. The girls stopped reciting the spell, and we looked at Donald and Terry. Their eyes returned to normal, and they stood still, expressionless. Then they fell to the floor, motionless. April and I ran to Terry while Vicky went to Donald. Take that ring off him, I told Vicky as I removed the ring from Terry's right hand. There was a fireplace at one end of the room, and we threw the rings into the fire. I took Terry's face in my hands and tried to get her attention while April cried for her mother. Vicky tried to get Donald's attention as well, but neither of us was successful. Terry looked at the two of us kneeling next to her, but there was no recognition or emotion in her face, it was completely empty. Donald was in the same condition. Vicky stood up and took out her phone to call 911. 
We tried to make the two of them as comfortable as possible, talking to them and trying to get them to recognize us, but to no avail. Paramedics soon arrived and examined the two before placing them on stretchers. We will take them to the central hospital, said one of the doctors. We got into my car and followed the ambulance to the hospital. Then we waited, and we waited, and we waited some more. Finally, several doctors came out to see us. One of them spoke to Vicky while another spoke to April and me. Mr. Thornton, the doctor said, I don't even know what to tell you. Physically, your wife is fine. All her blood and other tests came back normal. All her vitals are fine, and we haven't found any traces of illegal substances. However, I am concerned about her EEG results. It's almost as if the lights were on, but no one is home. So what should we do? I asked. I recommend leaving her here for a few days, he said. I would like to conduct more detailed tests under the supervision of our neurology department. Maybe we can figure out what's going on. I nodded. Okay, I said. After the doctor left, Vicky and I exchanged information and learned that the doctor had said the same thing about Donald. We stayed until the two of them were admitted to the ward. April and I talked to Terry, but she looked at us like we were complete strangers and didn't say a word. Finally, we said goodbye with a kiss on her cheek. Her face showed no emotion when we did this. We drove back to Vicky's store in silence, all of us in shock from the events of the last few hours. I promised to stay in touch as she got out of the car. She promised to look through her uncle's notes to find anything that might help. When she got out, April sat in the front seat. What now, Dad? She asked. I shook my head. I don't know, honey, I said. We'll do everything we can to support your mother and help her get back to normal, I guess. Are you going to divorce her? She asked sadly. You know what they were doing there, don't you? I know, I said, but somehow I think your mother had no control over it. Don't ask me to explain, I don't fully understand all this myself. What if she had? April asked. Then we'll deal with it when the time comes, I said. We drove home in silence but my mind was working at full capacity. April asked a good question. If Terry had truly and deliberately cheated on me, there would be no doubt that divorce was the only option. But something told me to put this thought aside. Robert was already at home when we arrived. He approached us excitedly. What's going on, Dad? He asked. Where have you been? We were in the hospital, I said. In the hospital, he asked. Is this mom? Is that her? What happened? Mom's not herself right now, April said. We can't explain it, and neither can the doctors. They will keep her for a while and run tests. Is she all right? Robert asked, concerned. Yes, I said. Oh God, Robert said. Is mom a psychopath or something? April glared at him and hit him. No, your mother is not a psychopath. I said, my voice calm but firm. I never want to hear you talk like that again. She has a problem, but they are figuring out what it is. In the meantime, we will support her as always. Understood? Got it, Dad, he said. Sorry, I didn't mean to say that. I know you didn't mean to, son, I told him. I opened my arms and hugged both of them. We cried a little before I let them go. I'll heat up dinner, April said. I nodded. Do it, I said. You guys eat and then do your homework. I have some business to take care of. Are you going to be okay, Dad? She asked. I think so, I said. It's all so overwhelming right now. I went into my home office and closed the door. I put my briefcase down and opened it. I pulled out the record with Terry's message put it on my turntable, set the speed to 78 revolutions per minute, and plugged in my headphones. I was hoping this would actually work. I grabbed a beer from my small refrigerator and sat down to listen to the record. Jack, it's me, Terry. I heard her voice in the headphones. I don't know where I am, but I wanted to write this down so you can understand what's going on. I know this will sound strange, but Donald Parker gave me this ring. He said it was a gift for all my work preparing the house for sale, but ever since he gave me that ring, strange things started happening. I can't really explain it, but it's like there are two people in my head, 
me and someone else, someone from the distant past. Her name is Annabelle, and she was the wife of Jonas Parker. She's using my body, and I can't control what she does with it. She talks through me and does things, and I can't do anything about it. I tried, but it was like I was pushed aside and forced to remain in a fog. I saw her do things with Parker, intim things. I tried to get her to stop, I honestly tried, but I couldn't. On the night of your birthday, Annabelle took control, and she was the one who did all those things to you. At first, she promised to give me that night, but she broke her promise. Then she made me watch and mock me the whole time. I tried to tell you, but she wouldn't let me. She said that I am a bad lover and you would be better off with a woman who knows how to have an intimate. I saw the expression on your face, and it hurt me to know that it wasn't me who did you so good. I felt so inadequate as a wife. I know this probably sounds like crap. If you said something like that to me, I would kick you out so quickly that I wouldn't even have time to blink an eye. But you have to believe me, I've never cheated on you. Never. You are the only man I have ever had and the only man I want to have. I fought them with all my might but was powerless to stop them. I feel so dirty and ashamed. I wouldn't blame you if you filed for divorce. I just hope that one day you can forgive me for my weakness. Please know that I love you with all my heart and always will. Tell the children I love them and hug and kiss them for me. Annabelle says that I will soon disappear forever and this is the last time I will be able to convey anything to you. Please, honey, find a woman you can love and be with her. Forget about me. I disappeared and I don't think I can ever come back. Just remember that you made me the happiest woman on earth and if I have to, I will wait here forever for you. I love you, Jack, she said, crying. Goodbye, darling. The recording ended, and I sat there with tears streaming down my face. She was right about one thing, if she had told me this before tonight, I would not have believed her. But there have been so many strange things lately that I couldn't help but give it a chance. Now I was wondering what to do next. My wife's body was in the hospital, but her spirit, or soul, or whatever you want to call it, was out there somewhere. For a moment, I felt like I was in the twilight zone and half expected Rod Sorong to come out and say something profound. I wondered what was on the other side of the record and took a quick look. The label was empty, but there were grooves there as if something had been recorded. I tried to play that side of the record, but I couldn't hear anything. I took the record off the player and put it back in the sleeve. A thousand thoughts ran through my head as I sat there, thinking about Terry's message. I knew I needed to talk to someone about this and I knew just the right person. I recorded Terry's audio onto a flash drive, saving it as an MP3. I took out my phone and made a call. Hello? I heard a male voice on the other end. Mike, are you busy right now? I asked. Mike Dunker was an old friend from college. In fact, he was more than a friend, he was my student advisor, and as my mentor, he was perhaps the only person on earth with whom I could discuss this. Well, I just finished eating meatloaf, but other than that, no, he said. Do you have a problem you need help with? Yes, I said. It's actually quite strange. I'd like to talk to you about this, if possible, and get your opinion. Well, if you're calling me, it must be something incredible, he said. Of course, come over. I'll have beer ready. I'm waiting for you. Thanks, Mike, I really appreciate it, I said. We finished the conversation, and I went into the living room, where the children were doing their homework. Will you guys be okay if I go away for a while? I asked. Yes, of course, Dad, April said. We're not really little kids anymore, you know. Don't remind me, I said. Okay, keep the door closed and don't let anyone in. Call me if you need anything. I might be gone for a couple of hours or so. Okay. Dad, Robert said. I got in the car and drove to Mike's house, a small two-room apartment not far from my own. He had lived alone since his wife died a year ago. When I arrived, he handed me a beer, and we sat in his living room. So, what's on your mind, Jack, he asked. Mike, I'm going to tell you a story you probably won't believe, I said. Damn it, I don't believe it myself, even though I went through all of it. I told him the whole story. He listened attentively without interrupting. 
When I finished, he took a deep breath and let it out slowly. Damn, he said. If anyone else had told me this, I would have sent them to a mental hospital. Do you have a recording of her message? Yes, here it is, I said, taking out the flash drive. He walked over to the table where his laptop stood and inserted the flash drive. We listened to it together. Then he pulled out the flash drive and handed it back to me. Neither you nor Terry are prone to exaggeration, he said. I know that she would never cheat on you. It's just not in her character. So now you're probably wondering what to do next, he asked. Exactly, I told him. Damn it, I don't want a divorce, but I can't live with this. Let me ask you one question, he said. Imagine that Terry was walking home one evening and she was grabbed and had an intim without her consent at gunpoint. Would you divorce her over this? Of course not, I said. That would be wrong. This was done against her will. Exactly, he said. There's no difference here. You heard her voice, felt her suffering, it's not something you can just make up. Yes, yes, but it's also strange, I said. Mike finished my sentence. Yes, he said. Well, if Jonas Parker is involved, weird is the order of the day. What do you mean? I asked. I went into his store several times just to look, maybe buy something. I talked to this old man while I was there. He was a true original, that's for sure, Mike said. I was interested in this guy and did some research. Someone wrote a book about him and his family. From what I've read, this old man never really recovered from the loss of his wife. For many years, he searched for answers. Some believed he was looking for a way to bring her back from the dead. Perhaps he finally succeeded. Wow, I said. So, are you set on getting a divorce? He asked. I don't know, I said. If it turns out that she did it deliberately, then yes. Are you in a hurry to do this? He asked. No, I guess there's no need to rush, given her condition, I said. What do you suggest? I think you should let the medics do their job, he said. Let them monitor her, do their tests. If she's faking it, they'll quickly find out, and you will get your answer. I think you're right, I said. Inside, I knew he was right. In all the years that I knew Terry, she never struck me as someone who was prone to flirting with other men. Even when we were in college, she wasn't the type to jump from one man to another. None of this was like her, and with her in the hospital, I knew she wasn't going anywhere. Look, why don't you go home and hug the kids and get some sleep? Mike said. Take it one step at a time. You'll have your answers soon. And of course, if you need to talk, I will always be here for you. Thanks, Mike. I really appreciate it, I said. Anytime, old friend, he said. You know, I had an idea. Why don't you bring this record with her message tomorrow, along with another recording of her voice, maybe a voicemail or something like that. I have a friend who works in a police laboratory. Perhaps he can confirm that it is indeed her voice. That's a good idea, I said. I'm curious how this message ended up on this record. I'll bring it tomorrow morning. Great, Jack, he said. See you then. We said goodbye, and I went home. The children had finished their homework and were playing games on the TV. I grabbed some leftover food and a Coke and watched them play. Even with the children nearby, the house seemed so empty without Terry. Eventually, we all got tired and went to bed. I held Terry's pillow and tried to fall asleep, but it wasn't easy. When I finally did, I dreamed of Terry searching for her way home through the dark fog. I tried to call her, but I couldn't speak. I woke up the next morning covered in sweat. I got up, showered, shaved, and dressed, then went downstairs. The children were already having breakfast and getting ready to go to school. I made sure they had lunch, then walked them to the door and watched them board the bus. I took Terry's message and copied the voicemail she left me onto a flash drive, then went to see Mike. He met me at the door when I arrived. Please be careful with this, I said. They're old wax records, and they can break easily. No problem, he said. How did you sleep, by the way? Not very well. I replied. Remember what I said, take it one step at a time, 
he advised. Are you going to the hospital to see her? Yes, I said. Maybe they will have some news. Okay, he said. Keep me informed. I'll let you know what my friend says. Thanks again, Mike, I said. I left and went to the hospital to visit Terry. When I arrived, I went to the nurse's station to inquire about her condition. They told me she had gotten dirty and needed a diaper. They also said that she needed to be fed like a baby. Apparently, she had forgotten how to eat and even how to use the toilet. The doctor saw me and came up to me. Mr. Thornton, I have an MRI schedule for your wife today, he said. I also contacted my colleague, who is a leading neurologist at Johns Hopkins University. He will come to review the test results. Will she be okay? I asked. Physically, she's in great shape, he said, but it's as if there's no memory of anything. So she has amnesia? I asked. It seems more serious than just amnesia, he replied. She seems to have forgotten everything, how to eat, how to use the toilet, everything. She does not respond to visual or verbal stimuli. Maybe I should try talking to her, I suggested. It won't hurt, he said. Maybe you can get her to react. It might also help if you bring the kids later, maybe she will respond to them. I nodded. I'll do it, I said. I'll keep you posted, he said as he left. I walked into Terry's room and looked at her. Physically, she looked fine, but there was no recognition in her face when I entered. Terry, it's me, Jack, I said, sitting down next to her. She looked at me with her big brown eyes but did not react. Can you hear me? Do you understand what I'm saying? Nod if you understand. There was still no reaction. I took her fragile hand and brought it to my lips, kissing her fingers as I sometimes did after we made love. Still no reaction. Talk to me, Terry, I said. The kids and I miss you. Do you remember the children, Roberta and April? Do you remember what April did yesterday? I looked at her face for any sign of recognition, but there was nothing. I might as well have been talking to a wall. An idea came to my mind, and I decided to change tactics. I looked at Terry before speaking. Why did you do that, Terry? I asked calmly. Why did you lie to me about that ring? Why did you have to sleep with this idiot? You probably knew that I wouldn't tolerate this. I need answers, Terry. If I don't receive them, I will have no choice but to file for divorce, and I will ask for custody of the children. Talk to me, Terry. Absolutely no reaction. I almost never used harsh words in her presence, and I hoped that this, along with the threat of divorce, would bring her out of the state she was in. But it did not happen. Either she was the best actress on the planet, or she really didn't exist. I sat with her a little longer, then got another idea. I stood up and kissed her forehead. I'll be back, I told her. I'll bring the kids later, and we'll talk then. She looked at me but didn't say anything. Her face remained passive. I left her room and asked about visiting hours. You can visit any time until 8 p.m., the nurse said. I thanked her and left. My first stop was Vicky's store. I went inside and found her behind the counter helping another customer. When she finished, she came over to me. How is your wife? She asked. I shook my head. Not good, I said. It's like she's not, not there. What about Donald? Same thing, she said, tears in her eyes. What are you going to do? I have an idea, but I don't know if it will work, I said. Can you keep looking for anything useful in your uncle's notes? I have already looked, but I will continue, she said. If I find something, I'll let you know right away. Thank you, I told her before leaving. From there, I went to my office. Everyone asked about Terry and expressed their condolences. I thanked them and made my way to my office, where I met Alan. How's Terry? he asked. I shook my head. Not good. Physically, she's fine, but it's like she's not there. They are going to give her an MRI today, and they have the best specialists coming to see the results. We just ordered flowers for her, he said. You just rest. If you need more time, take it, just let me know. Thank you, Alan, I said. 
He went about his business, and I went into my office. I closed the door and lowered the blinds, then took out a record with a blank label. After I started the old Victorola, I put the record on the player, turned it on, and began listening, hoping to hear Jonah's voice this time. However, I was prepared and turned on the voice recorder on my phone, placing it next to the external speaker of the Victorola. Once the playback started, I heard his voice. Jack, he said through the bullhorn. His voice sounded a little different, as if he were going through something painful. You surprised me, old man. I never thought you could do this, and you were able to recruit my own niece. Very cunning of you. Where's Terry? I asked. In the hospital, I guess, he said. Together with my nephew Jonas, I said. Her body is there, but she herself is not there, just like Donald. Where are they? He laughed before answering. You got that right, he said. Well, if you need to know, Donald is here with me, or rather, his spirit is here. Terry's spirit is in what can be called purgatory, where she will wander forever, even after her physical body turns to dust. There must be a way to get her back, I said. I'm sure there is, but even if I knew and wanted to help you, I can't, he said. Why? I asked. Because I'm being punished for what I did, he said. Same as Donald. We're in a place you never want to be. Where is it? I asked. You can call it hell, Jonas said. And Donald is there with you? I asked. Yes, he said, his voice trembling with some kind of tension. We are both being punished for what we did, just like my beautiful Annabelle, and we'll be here forever. I heard. Donald's body won't last long, maybe a year or two at most. From your point of view, time doesn't matter much here. Why, Jonas? I asked. Why did you do it? And why Terry? I just wanted to be reunited with my beautiful wife, he said. Terry was the best candidate. She was a descendant of Annabelle's sister and resembled her enough for my purpose. Donald and I planned all of this long before I died and Terry didn't know anything about it. Nothing? I asked. She was deceived from the very beginning. Donald gave her this ring in the store when Vicky was away, he said. It was a thank you from the whole family. She had no idea what we were doing until it was too late for her. By the time you and Vicky showed up, her spirit had already been driven out, and she never gave herself to you willingly. Never? I asked. It was Annabelle's job. She was always a lively and passionate person. There must be a way to get Terry back into her body, I said. Think, man. Tell me. I. I can't, he said, as if choking. I'm sorry, Jack. Old man, I can't think about anything but my pain. Please make it stop. His voice turned into a cry of pain and then disappeared. All I heard was the creaking of the stylus and the groove of the record. I realized that I wouldn't hear anything else, so I stopped the player. I finished the recording and listened to part of it to make sure I captured his voice. I removed the record from the player and put it back in its protective sleeve. I sat for a while, thinking about what to do next, then I got an idea. I packed the Victor Rolla along with a couple of records and headed back to Vicky's store. I went inside and Vicky's eyes widened when I replayed the conversation with her uncle. She listened to it twice to make sure it was really his voice. Tears welled up in her eyes when she finished listening. It's his voice, she said. There is no doubt about it. Hearing this is like reliving his death all over again. And my poor brother, Jonas used him, and now it's costing him his life. But your wife was completely innocent. What are you going to do? I have an idea. I said. I don't know if it will work, but at this stage, I'm willing to try anything. Maybe I can help you find your way back, and I think old Victor Rolla could be the key. She nodded. Let me know how it goes, okay? She asked. Definitely, I said. And I'm so sorry for your loss. Thank you, she said. Donald and I weren't that close, but he was still my brother. We promised to stay in touch. I headed home put the Victor Rolla in his office, and prepared dinner for the children, knowing that they would be home soon. I wasn't a great cook, but I had helped Terry a few times and decided to do my best. 
At least they wouldn't go hungry. When they got home, we dined on the hamburger helper I made. No complaints, I must say. Then I went to see Terry. The children were shocked when she did not respond to them. They tried to tell her about their day at school, but she just looked at them, not reacting or showing that she recognized them. I saw her doctor as we were leaving, and he told me that they had done an MRI on her brain, and a specialist would be back in a day or two to review the results. Is there any chance she's faking it? I asked him. He shook his head. I've dealt with amnesia before, but I've never seen anything like it, he said. Honestly, I don't think so. Just keep visiting her and talking to her. Maybe this will help. What if I bring some things from home? Could this help her? I asked. It definitely won't hurt, he said. That's exactly what we did. Over the next few days, I visited her whenever I could, telling her about what we did, about the places we saw, but it did not evoke any emotion in her, just like the photos and videos I showed her of our family vacations. Two days after I gave Mike the record with Terry's message, he called me. You have time? He asked. Of course, I said. What's happened? A friend of mine has finished analyzing this record and wants the three of us to meet for lunch, he said. You're free? Of course, I replied. Where? Well, there's this little diner on 3rd Street that you love, he said. How about there? Sounds good. I agreed. They make the juiciest burgers. Agreed. See you at 12 o'clock. We finished the conversation, and I arrived exactly at noon. I saw Mike when I walked in, he waved at me, and I noticed another man at the table. I walked up to them and ordered from the waitress. Jack, this is my friend Al Nelson. He works at the police lab, Mike said. I shook Al's hand, and he handed me the record and a USB drive. Nice to meet you, Al, I said. What did you find? Nice to meet you too, Jack, he replied. Well, I ran an analysis of the woman's voice print on the record, and it matches exactly with the voicemail from your wife. I also examined the record, and I can say it looks authentic. What do you mean? I asked. Well, if I had to testify in court, I would say that this recording was made over 100 years ago, he said and it was recorded by the same person who left that voicemail. How is this possible? I inquired. My tests cannot answer that question, he admitted. I believe it is theoretically possible that someone made this recording using early 20th century technology, but I don't know anyone with access to such equipment. The grooves on the record match those used for recording in those days. Honestly, I don't have an answer to this question. We spent the next hour eating and discussing the tests he had run. Mike and I were shocked by his findings, though I wasn't as shocked as Mike, considering what I'd been through myself. I decided not to talk about it. After eating, I received a call from Terry's doctor, who asked me to stop by his office. I told him I would be there, said goodbye to Mike and Al, and thanked them for their efforts. I walked toward Dr. Jacob's office, which was located in a building adjacent to the hospital. I introduced myself to his secretary, and she showed me to his office. Mr. Thornton, he said, this is Dr. Williams from Johns Hopkins University. He's probably the best in the business, and I asked him to look at your wife's test results. I shook the older man's hand, and Dr. Jacobs showed me a short video. I didn't know what I was looking at, so he explained it to me. This is typical brain activity of a normal, healthy functioning person, he said. I looked in admiration at the colored spots, amazed at what I saw. All this happens in the human brain, I thought. He stopped the video and showed me another one. The activity in this video was about ten times less than in the previous one. This is your wife's brain activity, he said. You see a significant difference? Yes, I replied. What's happening? That's what we'd like to find out, Mr. Thornton, Dr. Williams said. It seems that the part of the brain associated with memory and personality seems to be switched off. The good news, however, is that there is no tumor or growth causing this. So what are you suggesting? I asked. We would like to do exploratory surgery on her brain, Dr. Jacobs said. There may be something that doesn't show up on the scan. We contacted another specialist who has conducted research in this area, Dr. Stein. 
He has a clinic on the other side of the state and has expressed interest in the case. What we need is your consent to carry out this operation. What is the risk to my wife? I asked. There are always risks with surgery, Dr. Williams said. I don't think there's a great risk to your wife, but we are concerned that this condition may get worse. Another patient, the man who was brought in with her, shows signs of degradation. This can happen to your wife too. I really need to think about this for a day or two, I said. Please don't wait too long, Dr. Jacobs warned. If you do, there's a chance that her brain might just forget how to keep her heart pumping. Is it all that serious? I asked. Not yet, Dr. Williams replied, but it could come to that. Two days, no more, I said. Can you give me that much time? I think we can, Dr. Jacobs said, but no more than that. Her life is on the line. I understand, I said. More than you think. After saying goodbye, I headed straight home. When I arrived, I took out the record with Terry's message and looked at the opposite side, the one without the label. I started Victor Ola, put the record on the turntable with the empty label facing up, and placed the needle on the record. Terry, I asked, can you hear me? Terry, are you there? For a moment, all I heard was a creaking noise coming from the speaker. I was about to turn off the player when I heard her voice. Jack, she asked, is it really you? It's me, honey, I said, excited. I'm here. Where are you? Are you okay? I don't know where I am, Jack, she said. It's foggy and dark here. I'm scared, and I feel so lonely. I'm here with you, honey, I said. We missed you too. Jack, please help me get out of here, she pleaded. I got your message, I said. She started crying. I'm so sorry, Jack, she said. I know it was my body, but I never cheated on you. Donald tricked me into wearing that ring. I was never supposed to accept it or wear it, but I just felt forced. After that, Annabelle started to take over. You know that I would never cheat on you. Never. Please forgive me. I have already forgiven you, I said. I know what Jonas, Donald, and Annabelle did to you. They are being punished for this right now. Her crying intensified. I love you, Jack, she said. I miss you and the kids so much. Please help me. We miss you too, honey, I said. Listen to me, please. I have an idea. It's weird, but it's the only thing I can think of. What? she asked. Your body is in the hospital, I said. It's fine. Your body is healthy, except for your mind. They want to do exploratory surgery on your brain, so we don't have much time. What do you want me to do? she asked. I'm going to bring this Victor Ola and this record to your hospital room, I said. You will remain where you are and not move until you hear from me. Understood? Got it, Jack, she said. I heard nothing for a moment, then she asked, Jack, can you make one request for me, please? Of course. What is it? I asked. Sing to me, darling. Please, she begged. Sometimes I would sing along with some of the old songs I was playing. I didn't think I had a good voice, but she liked it when I sang. Sometimes she even joined me. I pulled out the CD and found the song I was looking for, an old World War II song sung by Vera Lynn. I put the CD in the player and started the song. Together, we sang, we'll meet again, I do not know where, I do not know when, but I know that we will meet again some sunny day. I couldn't finish the song because I was crying like a baby. At that moment, I heard her crying, too. I stopped the song and sobbed for a few moments, then wiped my nose. Sorry, I can't, I started. It's okay, honey, she said softly. That's all I wanted to hear. I'll stay put. You go to the hospital, and I will wait for you. Okay, I said. I love you. I love you too, Jack, she said. And only you. Hurry up now. I'll do it, I said. I turned off the record player. We'll talk very soon, okay? Okay, honey, she said. I braced myself before lifting the needle. I didn't want to risk scratching the record. 
I turned it off, then packed Victor Ola in the car along with the record. I also took a portable CD player and a CD of the Vera Lynn song. I left a note for the kids telling them where I was. They had a key to the house, and I knew they would be okay. I headed to the hospital and got a few strange looks when I walked in carrying Victor Ola. The record and CD player were in a backpack, carefully packed to protect the record. I went into her room and put Victor Ola on the table. She stood with a speaker pointed at Terry, who was lying on the bed. Terry looked at me, her eyes wide with surprise when she saw the record player. I set up the little CD player, inserted the CD, and started playing the song. Then I put the record on the turntable. I started playing the record, then sat down next to Terry. Terry, can you hear me? I asked. Now I hear, I heard her voice coming from the external speaker. Terry, I'm in your hospital room, I said. Can you hear the music? Yes, I can hear it, she said. Okay, I want you to focus on my voice and the music. You can do it, I encouraged. I can, she said. Follow the sound of my voice and the music. Focus on this and nothing else. Understood? I asked. Got it, she said. I'm looking around, but, wait, she exclaimed. What? I asked. I see something. Light, she said in the distance. Try to walk towards the light, I urged. I'm coming, she said. Can you hear the music louder? I asked her. Yes, I can hear it louder, she said, and I can hear you better, too. The light is getting bigger and bigger. I heard her breathing heavily, as if she was running. Now? I asked. Yes, she said, laughing. I hear you, and the music is getting louder. I feel it. How do you feel, Terry? I asked. Your love, she said. It's all around me. She surrounds me. It's wonderful, she added, laughing. I'm almost there. Oh, wait. Suddenly, her voice disappeared, and all I heard was the creak of the needle in the last groove of the record. I started crying. Have I lost her forever? God, no, I told myself. Suddenly, a ball of light flew out of the speaker, entered Terry's body, and I heard a sigh at the door. I saw two nurses standing there with wide eyes. Then I heard the most wonderful sound coming from the bed. Jack? Terry asked. I turned and saw her, her face changed slightly as she looked at me. Terry? I asked. Is this really you? You are back. She smiled and nodded her head slightly. It's me, honey, she said. We did it. We hugged each other and covered each other's faces with wet kisses. My wife had returned from purgatory, where Jonas tried to banish her. The nurses were shocked by what they saw, and one of them ran to the post to call a doctor. We both cried and held each other when the song ended. We'll meet again, I do not know where, I do not know when, but I know we will meet again one day. The next few days were stressful for all of us. Dr. Jacobs and Dr. Williams insisted that Terry undergo a full examination to ensure she was fully recovered. She was kept in the hospital for a few more days to ensure her recovery was complete. The children were delighted to learn that their mother had recovered. The reunion of mother and children was tearful but joyful. Brain scans showed that Terry had indeed recovered and returned to normal. The doctors wanted to know what happened, so I showed them the Victrola. They both shook their heads and left. They were happy about her recovery, but I felt disappointed in them. Well, okay, I thought. We brought her home and celebrated with a steak dinner at her favorite restaurant. While eating, she turned to me. So, Hero, she said with a laugh, where are you and Robert going to take us for a ride in your Chevy? We all had a good laugh about it. Later that night, she turned to me in bed. I'm no Annabelle, but I learned a thing or two from her, she said. About what? I asked. This one, she said. We made love. You like it, huh? She asked. Absolutely, I said. Well, since you saved my life and brought my soul back from purgatory, I guess I can agree to that, she said with a smile. Yes, I thought, my Terry is back. 
life continued in the Thornton household. Terry returned to work, and the children continued their studies. Robert and I worked on the old Chevy and finally got it ready for a ride. After completing all the formalities with the DMV, we took it out for a spin and had a great time. Donald, however, was not as lucky as Terry. A couple of weeks into Terry's recovery, his organs began to fail. Soon after, he died. Doctors said it was kidney failure. Terry wasn't too upset, although she did feel sorry for Vicky. I hope he gets what he deserves, Terry told me in a private conversation. I'm sure he's getting exactly what he deserves, I replied. I also felt sorry for Vicky, she helped save Terry from Jonas. After Donald's death, she locked the house and forbade anyone from entering for any reason. She still works in her uncle's store, selling off the remaining large reserves. A couple of months later, I looked at the record with Terry's message. I was thinking about getting rid of it, but I noticed something, the label had changed, and there was also a label on the back. I put it back in the protective envelope and wrote Don't Lose on the label. Tears still come to my eyes when I hear this Vera Lynn song, We'll meet again, I do not know where, I do not know when, but I know we will meet again one day. What do you think of our story today? I think the story was quite interesting and a little bit fantastic, which attracted me as a listener. What is your opinion? Write in the comments. See you in the next video.